Let's get started here. Uh, so good morning and welcome everyone to uh, the February ESIP Drupal Working Group Telecon. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Adam Shepard, even though it says ESIP Interop. Um, this, this is me down here in Woods Hole. Um, and I'll be moderating today. So just have a few quick announcements before we get started with today's presentation. Um, and first, on behalf of myself and David, we uh, I'm so excited to be co-chairing this uh, working group uh, for the next coming years. Uh, but we definitely wanted to thank Bruce Karen for uh, the just great work that he's done in building this community and organizing this uh, just insightful and informative telecons in the past. Uh, this has just been such a cool community for, for us all. So uh, just wanted to give a shout out to him and the work that he's done. Uh, okay, so if you are a member of this working group's ESIP mailing list, uh, you might have received an email announcing an opportunity that this working group has to send two people to this year's DrupalCon conference uh, in June out in Austin. Uh, we've got $1,500 of support for two people, um, $1,500 each, I should say. Uh, so far, we've only had one applicant. Uh, so if you know someone on your team or yourself uh, who works with Drupal or is interested in Drupal and wants to attend, um, you know, check out this web page here uh, on the slide that you can see posted in up in the WebEx software here. It says ESIP Google February. Um, or just shoot me off an email. My email address is adam at hui.edu or, or get in touch with us um, at some point. Or send me something on the chat here. I don't know. Reach out to us in some way if you're interested in attending DrupalCon. Uh, also, if you aren't on a mailing list and want to, uh, please jump on uh, to the ESIP Drupal mailing list. Uh, it's super easy to, to get connected to that. Um, if you run to, to a jam, uh, give myself a shout. All right, so let's get started. Um, just as a quick reminder, we are recording uh, the presentation today, uh, and we'll be posting up a, a video onto YouTube of this. So we ask that you just mute your mics if you have that uh, capability uh, on your computers and phones. Uh, during the presentation, if you are asking a question or participating, and this just helps us attain like really good audio or best audio as possible, uh, so that other people can enjoy the telephone in the future. Um, but please feel free to submit questions over the chat uh, during the presentation, and we'll certainly leave time at the end for Q and A and discussion. So, by all means, unmute yourself uh, when the presentation's over, so we can chat. So today's presenters are Inigo Sangil from the Long-Term Ecological Research Network Office and uh, Jason Talent from University of Michigan Biological Station and uh, Dave Reed, the Senior Drupal Developer at Lullaby. Uh, so I will pass off the WebEx ball to Inigo who will begin the presentation on Deans, a Drupal profile to serve and manage ecological data. So uh, in a go, let me pass the ball off. Thanks. Um, let me see if I can grab the controls and share my desktop. I've done this before. So. Mm -hmm. Here. All right, so good morning or good afternoon to some of us. And um, yeah, um, so what I'd like to do today with you guys is give you a very brief overview of what DEAMS is, and then um, Jason is going to do a brief demo, um, and then Dave Reed, who is the main developer, uh, and is going to cover some aspects of, of DEAMS, and then maybe we have a few more minutes to discuss um, what is the roadmap from here on? But first, I, I'd like to thank you all for for attending this meeting. I know that we all have very busy schedules and and uh, you have time to do any other thing. So thanks for being there, and uh, I hope you like it. And I hope you connect with us to um, to keep this exciting work going. So um, without further ado, I'm going to tell you a little bit of background of why are we doing this. And uh, so you should know that I work for LTER, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. Uh, the vision and mission of the LTER is there. You can see it on the screen. Um, but really, um, 
it is an, a distributed network of sites that conduct ecological research on the globe, and uh, mainly sponsored by the NSF and the countries that host this network. And it is been doing business for over 30 years, some even longer than that. And, and what I mean 30 years is uh, continuous records of many different variables or, or um, eco uh, ecosystem services that are out there. In the U.S., uh, you're seeing a map right now of the locations in the U.S. You have about 26 sites, and including Antarctica and uh, Puerto Rico and Alaska. And there are about 1,800 scientists associated with this network. However, the team that manages data and information for this network is really, really slim. And we thought that uh, we needed um, a good solution for manage this um, uh, the heterogeneity of data that we deal with. So um, the challenge is, 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 well, our goal is to provide ecologists and, and, and others with a good information management system. Uh, but we have a problem here of big data, not in the sense that it's really voluminous, in the sense that it's very heterogeneous, very, very dispersed, and it has many, many dimensions. On the left, you see a little bit uh, some of these dimensions. So we are looking at biodiversity, we are looking about the chemistry, um, weather data, um, a number of synthesis data sets. Um, overall, a single site in the U.S. might be monitoring monitoring of the order of 2,000 different parameters on different experiments and projects. Um, the dispersion of data is, is phenomenal, and everybody in every site does things slightly different uh, in terms of methodologies and data storage and data management. So this is kind of why is this a, a big data problem. Uh, and this is a, a slide from um, John Porter, who is on the call. And this is also uh, sometimes a big data problem in terms of the volume of data, and this is a LiDAR image of, of the Virginia ecosystems. Um, what the, the other challenge is that when we ship out the, our data to national clearinghouses that are out there, including the Oak Ridge National Clearinghouse, then it's, it's just aggregated with thousands of other data sets, and discovering this data, it becomes a chore if it is not well described. And, but the, ultimately, what we want to do is create a tool or a set of tools that facilitate the integration and synthesis of these diverse data. For that, we use the you know uh, the known standards to share metadata and describe the metadata, such as the ISO 19131, and of course the older standards sponsored by the content by the FGDC, uh, uh, the EML that we use at LTER. And, uh, and there are others that we might support or leverage in some way. And, but the idea is finally to, to provide scientists the means to, to just um, aggregate and integrate and synthesize this data. And for example, in here you see about four different temperature records and sea level for, from different stations. So this is kind of the goal that you have to have in mind. With the, with the, with the thinking that the data is just you know, everywhere in different formats and so on. So this is where, where DIMS comes into place. And, and DIMS, you know, we call this the Drupal Ecological Information Management System. We started in 2008, uh, pushed by Marshall White uh, here at LTR. And uh, nowadays uh, there is a um, profile that uh, Dave Reed uh, championed, um, who is in the call, and you will hear from him. And it really, um, we solidify our initial efforts into into this much more professional profile, which you are going to have the ability to to use. If you are interested, of course, in in developing and contributing like that, uh, we you should know that the re, the repository for this is in GitHub, and from here we push to to, to Drupal.org. Um, these are a list of uh, a few of the features that that Dean's pack together. Overall, between content and contributed and custom modules of Drupal, there are about 135 modules right now, uh, and we keep extending this profile. Uh, but it's, it's best to see this thing in action, right? Uh, this is the core of what we manage. We, we have research projects that are at different places that contain data sets, and these data sets have different data containers, and 
might have different parameters that are or observables that we are monitoring. These things are conducted on locations, and conducted by people using methodologies, and result in publications. So there is this network of interlink um, information that we need to manage and, and serve to the public in a way that, that makes sense. And so I'm going to pass. I'm going to ask Adam to pass the ball to uh, Jason Talent, and so he can um, he can continue um, giving you a little demo, and then I'll, uh, we'll give it to Dave and and so on. Okay. All right. Howdy, everyone. I'm going to work on sharing this desktop here. All right. So, hello, everybody. This is Jason Talent from the University of Michigan Biological Station. And hopefully, on your screen, you can see um, our implementation of Beams. Um, and I can take no credit whatsoever for this. Um, my predecessor, Kyle Kweiser, who worked with Inigo and, and various folks at LTER, um, put this together. And I'm only uh, sort of the maintainer at this point, although I'm as will be talked about later um, in the process of upgrading um, to the new instance of Deans in, uh, in Drupal 7. So what I'm going to do is essentially sort of take you through that model that Nico just showed and sort of show essentially what it looks like and how you navigate the site. So this is our main landing page. And you know things related to the site immediately uh, pop out. We've got publications from the site, uh, data sets, current research projects, uh, highlighted research sites. We have our data management policy and other data management related um, information for researchers and students, as well as some of our real time data. So we have a buoy and Douglas Lake, and we have various other instruments which are streaming live data. But what's most interesting and most relevant to Deems is um, starting with the data. So if we go to primary data sets here, these are data sets that we've archived in our system. Um, and you know, there's numerous, numerous data sets, but also just to sort of drill down and on one. Um, at our site these days, um, carbon flux is a big uh, area of research. So we can search for carbon flux, maybe. All right, and um, so these are these are data sets related to or have the keyword basket search carbon flux, um, and we can drill down to another data set here: forest heterogeneity effects and microclimate. So here we go. This is this is our implementation. So we've got this data set here. We have an abstract of the data set, the files that are available. Um, we categorize files into private or public file. Um, if folks are actively working on research or if they're in the process of publishing, then we sort of keep them in the private world. And if someone is interested, um, they can contact the data originator. Or if it's a data set that's open and available to the public, we have them as public files. And um, someone can click on the CSV or the zip file, and they can um, Say what they're, who they are, where they're from, what their purpose for use is, and then they can publicly download it. Um, as we scroll down over over here in this panel, we can see the originator, the contact, their associate researchers, the associated research sites, the referring projects, and we've got an EML export here. I'll scroll down, and then we'll go back to the EML export. So essentially, methods used in collection of the data. Some of them are long, some of them are short. Um, instrumentation that's used in the collection of the data, and then the variables that are within the data set, um, as well as some of the search terms that are here. So this is a great way of sort of creating that sort of interlinking between data researchers, publications, and research sites, which is really you know, the core of Deans. Um, I want to go under the hood in a minute here, just so you can see the background. Um, but I want to just do a little EML export here. So, um, what also makes this neat is that so now we have all this data, we have all this metadata into our repository, and with the use of um, 
the EML module that's in the background working, um, we can export the metadata out in, in an appropriate format that can then scale into various other repositories and discovery methods. So, you know, compliant EML for that data set, it's there um, and accessible. So I've got a couple more minutes. I just want to sort of, like I said, go under the hood um, so that you can see. Well, I take that back. I think with the time that I have, I'm going to just sort of show you how some interconnectivity here. So like I said before, um, if we were thinking about the, the model that Indigo showed, um, you know, you've got data sort of at its core, but it's interconnected lots of different things. And so um, we've got this data set, which is really neat, but I'm actually interested in something else related to the research site. So if we go to research sites, here's our research site. It's documented. We have coordinates for it, other data descriptors for the site. We even have photos or documentation of the instruments that's on the site. Um, and then we have links to publications. And so we can see all the publications associated with that particular piece of that instrument or that research site. And we also have the various data sets are associated with that uh, research site. So we can see that it's not just that data set, but numerous other data sets are being collected at that site based on the years and the current research projects that are also associated with that site. So this has been really great for us because it has, um, you know, even though a lot of these research groups are all working at the same site, they were sort of working in a vacuum and to some extent. And this has allowed for a lot greater collaboration between research groups um, than, than was previously uh, used before the implementation. And I think that I'll jump real quick here. And we'll just do a quick under the hood look. And so now I'm logged in as, a, as, an, as an admin on the site. Um, but what's great about this is that we have contributing users. And so um, as an information manager for UMBS, uh, I do a lot of the data entry as well as sort of the coordination and helping people QA QC their data. But the system is set up so that anyone who's a contributing user to the site can um, upload their own data sets and they can describe their own data files and whatnot. So, um, if one were to say, I'm a researcher and I've completed some research and I've got a data set to bring in, then I log into the system and I go to submit data and I go to a new data set and I can sort of input all the metadata associated with that file. Um, you know, so the basics of title and abstract, um, collection dates, and then methods you use for quality assurance. And this is all brought in through Deans. Um, my understanding is that it's all brought in through Dean. I would bet that my predecessor, Kyle, did some modifications to it, but I think the vast majority of it is packaged with, with, uh, with the Dean's instance. Um, and then so on and so forth. You know, once you've defined your data set, you can define data files that are associated with that data set, um, as well as, as, well as um, define new variables that are, make up that data set. And you know the power of a database, it all sort of comes together seamlessly for the user. Um, my understanding also is that in the new uh, development of Deems in Drupal 7, that some of this process for inputting data is streamlined, or there's some reduction in some of the redundancy that's there, um, which maybe can be talked about later. Uh, but I think that's, in terms of time, I think that's pretty good for me. So I will stop sharing here and let Dave take over. David. All right. Let's see. I'll share my desktop as well. All right. So my name is Dave Reed, and I've been involved in the Drupal community for um, a couple of years, I guess eight years now, so it's quite a while, I guess. Um, and I, I was working for Palantir.net, who's based out of Chicago, and we were working with uh, 
the, the long-term ecological research and, and LTER for this kind of Dean's distribution for 777. And it was a really interesting project to me because it was, you know, kind of an opportunity to leverage new Drupal 7 technologies, um, kind of take a revamp and, and a reorganization of how things were structured um, to make, hopefully make things work better for these information managers that are working on these sites every day. Um, and I take a, a personal amount of pride to that, like making sure that people that use the site every day, not the people like me that go in every month or so, like actually enjoy using the site. So I'm, I'm hoping that's, that's a positive goal from, from what we've done so far. I'll kind of show off a couple of things more on the Google side um, a little bit. Um, so one of the first things I wanted to show off was uh, the North Temperate Lakes Research Station uh, developed this really neat feature kind of independently of this kind of data explorer and like being able to actually view the data sets. Because um, most, for the most part, these data are in CSV files. It means you can download them and do whatever you want with them on your computer. But maybe I'm a researcher. I want to see if this data set, you know, does it contain something I might be interested in without having to download the entire one gigabyte file or something like that. Um, and so they developed this feature on their Drupal 6 version. And we found it really interesting as something to maybe bring in as a, as a feature for the entire platform. So everyone can have this. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a simple, it's a nice thing you can search and, you know, I'll find one base that has airports because that's the one I like to use when I was developing this. And so there's, I've got a, a soil temperature data set. If I go to the data, actually I have it open in a separate thing here. So I've got my hourly soil temperature data source uh, that I'm going to explore or download. And I can select which types of, which fields I want to have in my download. Um, I can select, you know, minimum and maximum year if I'm only interested in certain years. Um, if I was only interested in soil temperatures, from 8 p.m. to 12 p.m. Central or something like that, I could do that. Um, and with this Data Explorer, I can either preview it just here in the web browser or download a CSV. Um, and it's just, it's kind of nice because I get the option and I can start viewing it and interacting it right on the site. Um, so this is the feature that we kind of took over and revamped for the Drupal 7 site. So how this works uh, is you saw Inigo's kind of uh, steps of stuff. There's, there's a data set which has multiple data sources, and in those data sources, there's variables that describe the data that's inside of them. Um, and so how this kind of works is it, it uses the data source and its variables to kind of show the stuff independently uh, in this data explorer. And I'm going to use the word data a lot. I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, so this is the new Drupal 7 data explorer. Um, so I'm on uh, this this data source about something about water. That's very vague, but um, I can select which columns I want to have. Um, I can select all of them right away. Um, you know, if I want to filter by a certain date, I get a nice date picker um, for what times I want to include. Um, you know, if there's codes in my data set, you know, key value codes, I can select which ones I want to have relevant. Uh, and I get web preview or download, kind of like the same. And I can do exactly that. Let's see if it loads here. Yep. You know, I've got a nice, I'm showing the first 500 of 171,000. You know, I get a nice view of what what's possible here, and I can filter it down and then get a download if I, if I wanted. Um, and kind of how this works in, in the looking at the back end and the UI part of how this works is brought together. Um, so we've got this Canada Hydro data set. And it has these 10 or so variables um, that we're using for the data explorer. And it's got, you know, what type of thing is it? Is it just a nominal variable, just kind of generic? Or is it a date time? You know, is it a, a code list? Um, and that kind of thing. And so the user can view these directly here but on the administration side, if I'm editing the Canada Hydro uh, data source, I've got my variables all here, and I can edit all that stuff directly here. And it's kind of neat because, you know, if we change what kind of variable this is, if I were entering a new thing, if I select physical quantity, it kind of gives me more contextual things to enter automatically. So if I can enter in missing values, 
Um, I can enter in a unit what's being measured if it's a physical quantity, um, which this defaults to kind of a standard list provided by LPER. Um, but I can also enter in a custom one. So I'm not limited by their, their standard units if I couldn't find what I needed. Um, you know, I can set a minimum, a maximum, and precision. And then there's this data explorer setting that means, hey, I'm, I'm totally OK showing this thing in our data explorer. Or the user can filter on this, too. And that's what the, the information and manager would click on there um, to expose it. And then the also other thing that's required is you know, if we were to be using the CSV file to display this data explorer, you know, it could be very expensive on the server side to read a large CSV file, parse it for certain columns of a certain value. You'd have to load it all in and that kind of thing. And it's just not very a good way to do that. And so this North Temperate Lake Station had developed, you know, once we've got a data set or a data source, we're going to dump all of its data into a database, essentially, that matches what we're putting in the Drupal site. And that's the way that they can explore it and filter it easily. Um, and we kind of made that a little bit better to enter as well. Um, we actually have on the data source here, um, it's a new field called the schema field that allows you to just reference, refer to some kind of database or table. And so I can select, oh, I've got my, my data database. And I loaded this, this data set into the Canada Hydro table. And, or I could pick which one I wanted to. So this way you're not you know, giving your administrators a free form text field that could potentially load the user's table or something. It's very kind of structured to what they can select from here. Um, and that way it's kind of nice and giving them kind of structure and guidance too. Um, so once they've, got, they, once they've got the variables loaded in and their table selected, they can use that data explorer. And that's kind of how it gets all pulled together. Um, Another thing, I guess I kind of wanted to touch on the whole making the experience easier for the administrators too. Um, and I kind of showed that with editing the variables, um, you know, how it gave me a little bit of guidance of what type of variable is it I can enter in the more details. If it's a nominal variable, I don't need to see all that stuff. I just need to enter the minimum of what I need. Um, another interesting feature that we developed um, was for data entry, if you wanted to reuse a variable that you had used in a previous data set, um, we added this kind of like search box uh, for trying to reuse an existing variable. It essentially kind of clones it. So if I were to do, I can see above I hear comments as a variable I've used before. So let's say we wanted another one just like that. If I typed in comments, uh, I can see in my autocomplete results you know, the different types of variables named comments. And I, if I click one, it will automatically fill all the details that I had used on that previous variable for me. Uh, and this is a field, a custom field type that we developed uh, for Deans. And I think it works really well. And it's, it's trying to take that step of making things easier to do. Um, one of the nice things about this also, um, I'm actually editing the data set, the top level structured item. You know, one of the things we found kind of a little bit problematic looking at the, the Drupal 6 version is that maybe it's a little bit tough to, you know, bring all the stuff together. You know, you have all those different levels, the data set, data source, variables, and kind of all of those were administered or uh, edited separately and then brought together kind of with references. Um, with the new Drupal 7 version, um, we're taking advantage of a module called inline entity form. Um, which allows us to use references to stuff, but allows us to also administer them directly from the page. So if I just reload this edit form for this data source, which is the top level thing, um, to load everything, because it's quite a big form, that's the only thing bad about it, um, or not ideal. Load, load, load. Um, we've got our, this tab called data sources. And this is our reference field to the data sources relevant to this data set. Um, and I can go right in here and I can edit this directly, um, which is just really nice because I don't need to figure out which one I need to edit or it's not in a pop-up uh, that might take me away from the current page. You know, it's, it's right all here contextual to what I need. And you know, I can edit the variables directly from here, all that kind of stuff. And I can save 
I'll hit cancel there but I don't want to save anything on the slide site. Uh, otherwise, an ego might get mad at me. Um, or I could clone uh, this data source, say, you know, I'm running data collection from 2008 to 2012, and I want to start a new data set from 2014 to 2018, you know, but I want to copy everything that I did before. I could clone this data source just right here easily and then edit it again. Um, and, it's, and it's just kind of making that easy to do. Uh, and we also kind of have that same thing with other things that are referenced, like, you know, the people associated with this data set. You know, I can see right here that I've got, you know, this Professor Diane McKnight as the owner, and she's a person. And I can go in and I could edit, you know, who this owner of the data set is um, directly from here. So I can edit this person if I needed to. And this changes where she's used anywhere across the site. Um, so this is typically handy when you have a new person add. I can add a new person directly from here. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all I wanted to demo, and uh, yeah, I'll pass the pass the torch back. That is awesome, Dave. Um, but you still know, uh, you guys should know that Dave has developed about a hundred different modules for Drupal, and contributes to the core. And I mean, he's, he's probably the top developer in Drupal. And without him, none of this would have been possible. So we are incredibly grateful for him and he, the awesome work that he has done for, for Deans. Um, there are many other things that uh, we cannot cover in, in, in this um, short uh, hour. Um, I think I have about, I have about um, 10 more minutes or so um, to, to cover a couple of more aspects of, of Deans. And then we, we can go into a discussion, um, uh, Q and A with you guys. So, um, like um, one of the cool things that that Dave did is is he um, used uh, Drupal core feature to export the content that you've been seeing uh, in XML format, and particularly uh, uh, he made much more flexible what our former EML module to export as EML compliant XML so we could adapt to other standards and make it more manageable. So in here you see, for example, uh, for the Mexican uh, network of LTER, uh, NetGDC record, uh, so uh, compliant. We also, uh, in the same site, you see in uh, an ISO compliant for ISO 19139 with uh, proper extensions of ISO to accommodate uh, attribute level data uh, that the folks at uh, NOAA are, are pushing um, very well. And this is uh, the same record in this other XML flavor, in this EML compliance flavor that we use at the ELTR network. Um, and there are many other features, like I said, we, we cannot cover here, but uh, you, you can all visit um, the stuff, uh, what we've done um, by just asking us or visit the Drupal page at drupal.org slash project slash themes. And um, and um, what I want to focus a little bit also is in what is next because we are not done. Uh, we we keep continue developing and improving uh, this this work. Uh, there is um, a huge need for for many other features. And um, in here, for example, the what is immediately on the table are. Uh, so we're going to hook up the Data Explorer into some graphing capabilities. So many of the graphing libraries that are out there, uh, what we want to add is a button to um, the bottom of the Data Explorer that it says, where it said the web preview and download. So we'll just put another one that says graph. And uh, maybe with a little GUI, we'll attempt to graph either a scattered plot or a pie graph or, or a histogram or all sorts. Um, the other thing that I already uh, I'm quite advanced on is I have a, um, a migration package for those of you who are who have content structured in XML, perhaps in EML compliant uh, XML. So a migration that would uh, move your content from your XML into these themes structure. So it would you it will give you um, a head start on on 
on your work since uh, it could be laborious migrating uh, hundreds of projects and thousands of variables and data sources, right? So since you already have done the, the legwork of creating XML compliant um, content uh, when we want to make it uh, bridge it to Deans that way. So uh, it's, it's, it's in development still, but uh, fairly advanced. I have to do a couple of more things. Um, the other thing that we would like to do is is the species taxonomies, right? So there are some Drupal solutions out there, uh, such as the scratch pads and encyclopedia of life uh, solutions to manage, um, you know, taxonomies, uh, species taxonomies, right? Um, instead of reinventing, I mean, our philosophy has been always to try to leverage the work that is out there, right, and the great work that Dave Reed and many others have done with Drupal, and just adapt it a little bit so it serves the needs of of the people who are doing science and, and ecology and biology. So um, th these are just three features that we would like to do, but there are um, a ton more of things that we have in the backlog of things that we come up with. This is where you come from, right? Um, so connect with us and and. And so you can send an email to um, uh, to me or to anybody at the Dean's group. Um, you can also, if you miss this presentation or this recording, you can contact Adam or Bruce Karen. He, he knows also us. Uh, we'll be at, um, at the DrupalCon. We um, are in the process of submitting a session for, uh, proposing a session for DrupalCon. And uh, if we get vo voted, uh, well, uh, you'll see us there. And uh, Please get involved. There are many ways in you can get involved in this work. Uh, you can use it. It's out there for you to download and um, uh, in a profile. So all you have to do is follow um, fewer steps. You don't need to, to 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 download the course separately or anything. It's everything packaged together. Um, the, just read the readme to for for things that you need to do. Um, of course, you you will encounter bugs. Or, or you will have feature requests, or so just go to Drupal.org uh, to the Deans project page and use the issue queue like you would use for for any other Drupal module, and um, just um, try to detail there uh, your request, and uh, we'll address it. The way we work is uh, so Dave has taught us how to use GitHub uh, in the Drupal framework, and that is. It has made this project way more sustainable, right? Before, before we had um, we had it hosted in Subversion in in Google Code, and it it proved to be complicated. Now, now is um, because it's a, is in, um, in first in GitHub and second has a, a very logical way of being packaged and produced. Uh, it's so much easier to maintain. But um, so if you wanna, if you feel brave and you wanna be involved in the development or in any facet of the of the many facets of this project. You might be more interested in the local field or more interested in, in certain specific feature. Please um, get involved. If, if you cannot get involved in those means, but uh, you know somebody or yourself that, that might have funding to uh, further and advance this work, so please get in contact with us or participate in one of the proposals that we might submit uh, shortly to either NSF or any or other federal agency uh, to advance this work uh, also with, with you in mind. So with that in mind, um, I think I, um, we are about 40 minutes, uh, 41 minutes past the hour. I want to open the uh, floor uh, for questions and any other discussion that you might want to have. So I'll, I'll give it to, back to Adam, and I want to thank you all for being there today. And so I'm going to give it back to Adam so he can uh, direct the rest of the conversation. Yes, thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Inigo, Jason, Dave. Uh, really cool work that you guys are, are involved with here. Um, so now, if, if anyone has questions or just wants to, to jump in and discuss a topic here, please unmute mute yourselves and, and uh, let's chat. I know I've got questions, but I'll, I'll hold off in case someone has someone else has ideas or things they want to share. Hey, I'm David here. Uh, 
thanks everyone for um, sharing this work. It's really inspiring. Uh, I had a question about, uh, I guess, the uh, how generic the data explorer is. Um, what kind of databases can it connect to, and um, can you define your own schemas for those, or is very much is it more DEAN specific? Well, since uh, Dave Dave Reed um, developed um, the schema reference uh, for the Data Explorer, who um, gave us the ability to see and query external databases, I'm going to let him jump in and, and tell you a little bit how to extend this beyond MySQL. Sure. So, for the question of what kind of databases can it connect to uh, for the Data Explorer, um, I believe pretty much anything that Drupal can support out of the box, which includes uh, MySQL uh, or MariaDB, uh, Postgres, or SQLite, um, is supported out of the box by Drupal Core, and that could be connected to. Um, and I know there's other database uh, like connection projects for you know, Oracle or the, the more non non typically standard database um, softwares. As long as there's, as long as it can, as long as Drupal can speak to it. Uh, so can the Data Explorer. Um, and as far as altering the schema of things, we're talking about like altering like the actual schema in that database where it talks to. Yeah, I guess um, defining fields and uh, data types for those fields and linking those with the schema and the database. Um, so I th I'm trying to remember offhand. Nigo, chime in if you feel like it. Yeah. Um, so I don't think so. The, it's a think about it, right? It's a data explorer. So we we assume that you have a database with all your legacy data, and all we want to do is have read privileges. So the the schema reference module, what it does is using the read privileges that you have that you have encoded in the settings.local.php. Uh, you can browse the schema, but you cannot modify it. We, we kind of um, didn't go that far. Um, it can be extended that way, but um, we didn't go that far. What we wanted to do is give the uh, the ability to not just see the metadata and the descriptions of the data, but to go further and drill down on and subset and filter uh, the scientific data values, dates, Code list and the like. Sure. And I think to maybe kind of clear up something too, I think that the, the Drupal Data Explorer kind of makes some assumptions about what the schema types you've used in your external database. So like date fields, it kind of assumes that you, either they're a text field or like used for some kind of standard date field that would accept kind of an ISO date format. So year, month, date, and then time kind of a thing. And it's kind of up to the individual sites to make sure that um, those things kind of link together. It, it, I mean, it could be kind of any crazy kind of schema possible. So we have to kind of assume some things first, and it's kind of up to the individual sites to make sure it actually works. So. Sure, sure, that's that's great. Um, thanks, Zach. I'll pass back to Adam, and thanks to him for hosting today. Yeah, other than that, it's, it's pretty agnostic about the the data table or the particulars of your data. Uh, as long as you describe it well using Dean, so you describe your variables or your columns in their variables and they are consistent, then um, it will allow you to, to query based on, on those descriptions and, and, of course, a, a few more assumptions like they have said, which that, you know, we, we the, the, we, we design it like that with in having the diversity of data in mind, right? We knew that we know that there is many different ways to encode things in databases and declare uh, columns and and parameters. So we couldn't um, uh, impose a particular schema, right? This is pretty much agnostic. You give it the connector, where the database is, the I, you know the your, the IP address some reading credentials to the database that are not transparent as an administrator, that are not transparent to anybody, 
And with those, um, and the administrator sets this up, right? It connects, you, you hook up a particular data source with a table or a view of this external database, and then you're ready to go. You're ready to explore those data and filter out things that you might not want. Yep. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, are the assumptions and standards for the uh, data encoding, are they documented anywhere, or should we get in touch with you? No, no, there are no assumptions. Um, not really, not that I know. Uh, of course, you might encounter a, you know, every now and then you're going to bump into some issue. Uh, just let us know and um, we'll try to address it. Um, but as far as we know, we there is no encoding, um, you know, uh, issues with, you know, uh, about the data. Yep. Awesome. I'll pass it back for another question. Oh, thanks for that question. Oh, yeah, thank you. So this is Manil. Uh, I have a question about search. So is it a standard Drupal search that you're doing, or is there any special module to do that to? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, we we provide out of the box uh, the database index, not just the Drupal index. Uh, so we have we have a module that is called the Facet API, and so it's a level above the standard uh, Drupal index of, of a few um, of fields. So we let you uh, using the Facet API, we let you have a faceted search. We didn't cover that. It's, I can I can give you I mean if you go to the product page there is documentation about the facet API. Okay. And so you can have all like you know, two hundred data sets and you have your facets on the right or on the left, whatever you put them. And and those facets might allow you to narrow or filter down by location, by duration of the data set, by keywords that you have, might have used to tag the data set, by principal investigator or other, so there are many facets, right? Like like you right. use every day when you go shopping, right? Like you have these, these ways to narrow down. When you, so that uses the standard database index, the, the facet API. However, uh, this module allows you to use Solar, right? So you can, instead of hook up the database index, you can leverage of uh, Apache Solar Index, which is uh, probably give you a performance boost and enhancement. Now, I know that the group that is working with us, the, the, the TFRI, the Taiwanese um, uh, Forest Research Institute, showed us how to integrate the solar index with DEEMS, uh, Apache Solar with DEEMS, and, and uh, so it's something that uh, we didn't package, it's, it's ready to go, but we didn't want to impose a uh, dependency on, on Apache Solar because it requires a little bit of work on the, on the server, right? Right. Speaking from a, a like one level up, uh, we, we actually use the search API uh, module in the in the distribution. So it, it's actually kind of quick, quite easy to swap out like, oh, I want to switch from database search to solar. That way you don't have to like change, oh, I was using the Apache Solar module and now I need to switch to this other thing. Um, so it's kind of, as long as it's supported by the search API project with solar and database search is in the box, um, it, it's ready to go. You just may need to do an initial re-index when you switch, but that's it. Hey guys, uh, this is Adam Shepard here. Um, I was I had a question about the serialization formats, like ISO and FGDC and EML. Um, can you guys just talk about sort of how you guys approach that from a development standpoint, like what, in, in terms of Drupal and, and how you guys architected that? Yeah, this was Dave, uh, Dave, um, uh, Dave had a brilliant uh, way to implement this. Um, we have some documentation, but I'm, I'm going to let him explain how he approached this. Sure. Do you mind actually passing uh, screen sharing back to me for just a second? Sure. 
All right. So it was it was interesting coming into this, um, kind of taking a fresh look at, okay, so how we've got this all this data represented in Drupal node. How do we then kind of like standardize exporting it into you know, EML? It's kind of the one format that we took the approach to um, when we first did this. But there's also this opportunity for all these other standards to possibly come down the road uh, or be supported after um, we first did the install profile. And I'm a huge proponent of uh, a terminology in Drupal 7 called view modes. Um, it's kind of a standard way of saying, I have a thing and I want to render it using this kind of, I want to render it using RSS, or I want to render it, view it using a teaser view, uh, or I want to view it just the full view. Uh, and it's these view modes which are really powerful to output fields, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I was like, well, why can't we use that for EML? Uh, and that's, that's kind of essentially what we've done. We have this EML module uh, that's custom to the install profile that is responsible for kind of bringing everything together uh, using the EML view mode uh, into uh, a template file uh, for the data source. And so we can actually see this if I go to the data set, and if I go to manage display, um, I'll actually be able to actually select how I want to have things output in the EML. It's a little bit of a mix of hard-coded stuff in the template and being able to configure it here in the UI. Um, but I think it's a good kind of mix because you want kind of that standardization, but say I wanted to tweak one little thing. Um, so here I'm in my data set, the managed display of my content type, and I have this new kind of subtab for EML, um, like my other things that I would have in a Drupal install. And I can actually see that I've configured these to display as, uh, we've, we've made these custom formatters for all of these things. Um, so there's, EML text that outputs as a uh, text uh, XML tag. Or we have this certain, we have a temporal coverage that kind of does automatically the thing with the date field. Um, and, you know, we could do, we did, this looks like the generic, this generic EML element for kind of references. And it's kind of nice because I set right here, you know, okay, if I have multiple values of this owner creator field, you know, should it output separate creator tags? So if I have four values, should it be four different creator tags back to back as siblings? Or should it be one creator tag and those elements in output inside of that thing? Um, so there's a little bit of flexibility here um, in how to customize that. And then Nigo has done a great job in his team in extending this uh, concept uh, into other formats as well already. Uh, so it's, it gives us nice kind of standardization for how to output something, and I think I thought view modes was a good fit for that. Yeah, that's that's really cool. It's it's really an interesting concept and, and way to abstract, uh, you know, all these serialization formats. Um, and certainly, there must have been some overhead in the development, but it'll probably pay off as you know newer serialization formats emerge that you know are important to the community. So that's really cool. Yeah, and then you know it all comes together kind of. At, at the template file, um, so individual sites can override how they output EML if they wanted to. Um, and so, I mean, it's pretty much basically output this field, however it's configured to do so. Um, and it, it gives a lot more flexibility that way. We're hard coding a lot less logic in code for, oh, the creator should be output this way. But it's, we're more abstracting that out into the view mode and the template. Stop sharing again. Great, thank you. Yeah, it, it really it really has enabled us to quickly deploy uh, XML um, content compliant in many different formats. Because once you see how to produce a field formatter and a view mode and a template, uh, then it's easy to say, "Ah, oh, well, I, I need a uh, you know NASA's DIF." Right, the data interchange format compliant. It's just um, it's like he said, right? You have the teaser module, the teaser mode, and in in, in, the, uh, in Drupal you have 
as Ari says, why not can have your your piece of content um, displayed as instead of RSS XML like uh, ISO XML, right? Is is um, it, it it it's different from what we did before. Uh, we we had a, a custom module that. It was all in PHP code, and um, we were not happy because it wasn't integrated with the Drupal framework, right? And so, who who is better to to do this thing? So, a person who knows Drupal inside out. And I didn't even know view modes before before I started working with with Dave, and and I didn't know that they were in core. So, I mean, I did know, like I used them, but it's one of these things that you use them without even knowing, mm -hmm. and. So once you get the hang of it, then then you can um, you can um, actually expand it. I, I have a few blog posts that kind of um, try to walk you through through the field formatters and the hooks that you have to write in order to implement uh, these few modes. If you are interested. Great. Are there any other questions or comments or? I've got uh, got uh, one uh, question that I hope is a quick one because I know we're coming up on our time there. Uh, right now, the the data uh, is all sort of focused on the tabular data, but occasionally we end up with data sets that really aren't tabular in the sense that uh, if you want to just think of them as being sort of a blob of, of you know binary object uh, that typically we would use in EML, we would refer to that as an other entity. Uh, do you have any ideas as to sort of how difficult it would be to implement uh, an addition that will allow it to handle that as well? Yeah, um, thanks, John. That is, that is a great question. And I can tell you that it would not be difficult. As a matter of fact, could you um, share this, um, uh, pass me the ball, uh, Adam? A little bit. Sure. Great. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a little bit of the custom extensions that uh, we've done for for the Sevilla site. And let me see if I can. Um, all right. So, so the Sevilla site has, for example, GIS data, right, which you are uh, familiar with. It, it doesn't conform with the regular. Um, uh, data. Uh, so, so she might have a zip file um, which might contain uh, layers, right? Yeah, special layers, uh, shape files, maybe an XML to describe the metadata, a whole a whole package that would describe a um, a particular data set. So, in this case, she, um, she might have these um, GIS or FGDC uh, native or ESRI native native metadata set uh, with an associated file. So the way we go about it is, in this particular case, uh, we have a, a small content type called special data, right? It's, in this case, it's very simple. It only contains a very few fields that are, and, and they are not even um, breaking down the metadata in the, in the granularity that you need. So you might you you know we have the ability to upload a KML file or a shape file and things like this. But if I were to have a content type that has ESRI specific fields, all I have to do is create field formatters that comply with the ESRI specification. For example, if you wanted to export in in ESRI or the EML specification for that singular field, right? And we've done this in Drupal six. Uh, when we were, I was working with the USGS, uh, we, we did a number of content types in Drupal uh, to export the uh, uh, of GIS compliant fields. Uh, so it, the, the answer, the short answer, it can be done. It will involve just um, creating the specialized content types and fields that describe these new data entities and then compliant. Now, if, if we are using media, for example, another great case is videos, right? So videos, um, we probably adapt the media module 
that has already the hookups to YouTube and other video um, uh, services. And then just create a field for matter for these videos that complies with, for example, in EML, the other entity branch of EML, right? And that way, uh, we'll extend and, and, and uh, expand the coverage to non-tabular data from it. So thanks for, for pointing that out, John. While I am um, waiting for um, Adam to um, um, kind of wrap up, um, maybe I, I can uh, flash uh, the, the faceted search. So here on the right, uh, on the top, sorry, you have a, a Google Live search. Um, by default, you have all the hits of the data sets for the Sebieta LTR. But on the right here, you see facets that you can filter by. In LTR, for example, we use five core areas, and, and there are 100 data sets associated in the Sevilla. Uh, so you can clear out all of them that are not involved with population. And you have keywords and related uh, locations where we we um, uh, sampled and filtered. Have data set duration. So you know, if there is one data set that, that spans 19 years. In here and five months, and so you can that. But this is a more powerful search in the sense that that it um, instead of giving you a long list of data sets that are, that that uh, are found by a keyword, you have the chance to narrow down by a few hints about what is what is in there and how how is it grouped. Great. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, yeah, we all look forward to DrupalCon or Deans at DrupalCon uh, to, to discover more about what this platform can do. It's really cool. Um, in closing, I just want to offer up to anyone, um, you know, if you're, if you're interested in presenting anything that you've done with Drupal or, or have any ideas for Telecon, please get in touch with uh, David and myself. Um, and uh, finally, our next telecon is going to be March 26th, uh, and we're going to be brainstorming about just some feedback that David and I got about uh, the thematic meta issue tracker uh, project that we're, our, our working group is working on. Uh, so please uh, look forward to the mailing list for more details about that. Uh, so thank you guys very much, and uh, we'll uh, see you next time. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, on behalf of uh, LTR and, and Dean Sunday. Um, thank you. Yeah, it was a great opportunity. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Bye. Bye.